Ladies and gentlemen, today I'll give you a small crash course on the seven different sources of international law. They are custom, treaties, general principles of law, judicial decisions, juristic writings, equity, and other sources. I promise you that after listening to this episode, you will know the basic meaning of these sources of law, the relevant legal provisions involved in each of these sources, along with the important case laws. So, let's begin. By sources of international law, I mean the origins or places from which the rules and principles of international law are derived. And these sources help establish the legal framework that governs the relations between countries. You must be thinking that why study about the sources of international law? Why not simply study what international law is? Why take all this trouble? It is because the sources of international law collectively shape the rules and principles that guide the behavior of nations in the international community. And by understanding these sources, you will gain insight into how international law is formed and adopted to address global challenges and promote cooperation among countries. Here, the most important legal provision you are supposed to remember is Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, ICJ. It provides for six different sources of international law that are to be applied by the courts while deciding a dispute. These six sources are customs, treaties, general principles of law, judicial decisions, juristic writings, and equity. Let's understand them one by one. The first source is custom. It is like the unwritten rules that countries follow because they have been doing it for a very long time and every country believes that it is the right thing to do. For example, most countries agree that it's not okay to attack other countries without a good reason. This understanding has become a custom that everyone expects and follows. Even though there might not be a specific written agreement or law, it's understood that attacking another country without a good reason is impermissible in international law. Malcolm Shaw, a famous writer on international law, defines custom as a long-established and commonly adopted practice that has acquired the force of law. Thus, even if something is not a law in the traditional sense of the term, Still, if it is treated or equated with a law, then it could be said that it has acquired the force of law. You are also required to know that there are two preconditions that need to be met before a custom becomes a valid custom in international law, state practice and opinio juris. These reflect the manner in which states behave and incorporate the custom into their own law. To know more about state practice and opinio juris, please watch my earlier episode, the link for which has been provided in the description below. Now broadly speaking, there are three types of customs, general, regional and local. General customs are followed universally in most places and jurisdictions. Regional customs are rules that bind only a particular group of states in a particular region. For example, North America may have its own regional customs distinct from South America or Asia or Europe. And local customs are rules that bind only a small number of states in a limited geographical area. Like India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka may have a local custom that may not be followed elsewhere. Lastly, the importance of custom as a source of law has been discussed in various cases such as the Lotus case and the case of Nicaragua versus United States. The next source of international law that you should know is treaty. It has been defined in Article 2A of the Vienna Convention of Law of Treaties 1969 VCLT, as an international agreement concluded between states in written form and governed by international law. Thus, essentially, a treaty is a written agreement between two or more countries and is subjected to various principles of international law. The nomenclature of treaties is immaterial. 
एंड यू मे कॉल इट एज एन अग्रीमेंट और अ पैक्ट और अ कन्वेंशन और अ प्रोटोकॉल और अ चार्टर और एनी अदर सिमिलर टर्म यू शुड ऑल्सो नो दैट अ ट्रीटी बिटवीन टू नेशन इज कॉल्ड अ बायोलेट्रल ट्रीटी एंड अ ट्रीटी बिटवीन टू और मोर नेशन इज कॉल्ड अ मल्टीलेटरल ट्रीटी समटाइम्स इवन नॉन स्टेट एक्टर्स मे ऑल्सो बिकम पार्ट ऑफ अ ट्रीटी अ गुड एग्जाम्पल इज पेरिस अग्रीमेंट ऑन क्लाइमेट चेंज वे आर सिविल सोसाइटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन सच एज द क्लाइमेट एक्शन नेटवर्क कैन बिकेम अ पार्ट ऑफ इट हियर यू मस्ट ऑल्सो नो दैट ऑल द ट्रीटीज मस्ट बी ऑब्जर्व एंड परफॉर्म्ड इन गुड फेथ दिस इज कॉल्ड द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ पैक्टस एंड सर्वेंडा इट हैज बीन प्रोवाइडेड इन आर्टिकल ट्वेंटी सिक्स ऑफ वी सी एल टी टू नो मोर अबाउट पैक्टस एंड सर्वेंडा प्लीज वॉच माई अर्लियर एपिसोड now there are various examples of treaties such as the antarctic treaty of 1959 patent law treaty of 2000 vclt of 1969 kyoto protocol of 1997 and the relevance of these treaties as a source of international law has also been discussed in many cases such as the north sea continental shelf case next the third source of international law is general principles of law which is fairly limited in scope it is also a term that is hard to define and simply means general principles that guide different legal systems such as the principle of good faith doctrine of res judicata principle of estoppel doctrine of proportionality and the principle of pacta sunt servanda general principles of law are regarded as a source of international law because the international law is relatively new and many times issues arise on which there is no international law whatsoever and in those circumstances the court may apply a legal principle that is usually applied in various domestic or internal legal systems of different countries further these general principles have also been applied in plethora of cases to fill the uncovered gaps arising in international law from time to time some of the pertinent cases are corzo factory case german settlers in poland case and the corfu channel case the fourth source of international law is judicial decisions it means the judgments and orders that are passed by the international courts on different matters at different points of time you should know that article 38 of icj statute regards judicial decisions as a subsidiary means of determining law what do we mean by subsidiary means it means a secondary source of law rather than an actual source of law a source of law that is at a lower pedestal further article 59 of the icj statute provides that the decision of the icj has no binding force except as between the parties who have submitted themselves to its jurisdiction so if india and pakistan submit a dispute before the icj the decision of the icj would be binding only on india and pakistan and only for that particular matter even if a similar matter arises in the future both the countries will again have to file a dispute before the icj however this does not mean that judicial decisions are not important they are still relevant because of the doctrine of precedent according to which courts follow their previous decisions when deciding similar cases and generally speaking the courts do not depart from its settled jurisprudence unless there are compelling reasons to do so and the importance of judicial decisions as a source of law has also been discussed in many cases like the genocide convention case the note bomb case and the case of cameroon versus nigeria the fifth source of international law in this series is juristic or academic writings again like judicial decisions article 38 regards them as a subsidiary means of determining law that is a source of law that is at a lower pedestal however this again does not mean that academic writings are irrelevant the influence of academic writing in the development of international law has been immense scholars such as gentili hugo grotius vettel 
एंड पीफनडोर्फ वर कंसिडर्ड एज दी सुप्रीम अथॉरिटीज ऑफ देयर टाइम्स ऑन इंटरनेशनल लॉ हाउ एवर विद दी राइज इन दी नंबर ऑफ इंटरनेशनल ट्रीटीज दी सिग्निफिकेंस ऑफ अकेडमिक राइटिंग्स हैज डेफिनेटली रिड्यूस्ड टू एन एक्सटेंड नेवर द लेस गुड बुक्स ऑन इंटरनेशनल लॉ आर स्टिल बींग साइटेड बाय दी लॉयर्स बिफोर दी इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट्स एंड वेन एवर अ न्यू ब्रांच ऑफ इंटरनेशनल लॉ इज टू बी डेवलप्ड दी अकेडमिक राइटर्स प्ले एन इंपॉर्टेंट रोल इन गिविंग प्रॉपर शेप टू इट some of the pertinent examples of juristic and academic writings are the oxford handbook of international law and the famous book of the law of nations by emer de wetel now the sixth and the last source of international law as per article 38 2 of the icj statute is equity actually the term used in article 38 is a latin term ex equo et bono that literally means as per what is equitable and good it basically means the body of principles constituting what is fair and right and represents the various values present in a legal system it includes principles and doctrines such as rule of law natural justice peaceful coexistence and other similar principles honestly i find the principles of equity to be quite similar to general principles of law nevertheless the icj statute has made a distinction between the two so that is why we should study them and like other sources of law the principles of equity have also been applied consistently by the international courts in various cases such as the run of kutch arbitration between india and pakistan in the year 1968 north sea continental shelf cases and the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons advisory opinion case further apart from the just discussed six sources of international law there are some other sources of international law as well that have not been recognized under article 38 of the icj statute yet they are liable to be considered as valid sources of international law these other sources of international law generally evolve in development of new laws and from new interpretations of existing laws some of the key examples are un security council resolutions you would be surprised to know that these resolutions are considered as binding by virtue of article 24 and 25 of the un charter according to which the members of united nations must accept and carry out the decisions of the security council So now you understand why Security Council is considered as more important than the General Assembly of United Nations. Another source of international law could be soft laws such as the codes of practice of standards and recommendations and guidelines by various international bodies from time to time. Soft law basically indicates an instrument or provision that is not a law. but its importance within the international system is such that particular attention requires to be paid to it similarly works of international law commission and other international bodies such as ancitral involved in drafting and formulation of law also act as a source of international law in many cases last but not the least unilateral acts like an accession of crimea by russia may also give rise to international legal obligations at times and may be considered as a source of international law so that was all about the sources of international law in nutshell i hope you enjoyed listening to the show and please do not forget to like and subscribe see you next time till then stay tuned